I have two words for you. Malware injection. Okay, scratch that. I have three words for you. Debug backdoor. No. Uh, wait. Sorry. I have six words for you. Cracking keys with DPA for fun. Okay. I'm going to stop there because I'm kind of scaring myself. But folks, these words should scare us. Scare us right into action. I have said over and over on Chalk Talk, security should not be an afterthought. And I don't think that's really true anymore. I believe we think about it a lot more than we ever did. But you know who else is thinking about it more than ever before? Yeah, the bad guys. Those men and women who do crack DPA for fun. I mean, I guess, but maybe I just have a different idea of fun. Uh, I don't know. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Now is a better time than ever to start talking about differential power analysis, how to thwart side channel attacks, and why a secure boot with root of trust is vital for your next design. Please welcome Gregory Guess from Silicon Labs. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Gregory and I are delving into the world of DPA, secure debug, and keeping those bad guys at bay with the Silicon Labs EFR32 Series 2 platform. Let's go. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about the Silicon Labs EFR32 Series 2 platform. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. So I understand that Silicon Labs launched Series 2 recently. And one of the big aspects of that announcement was some security capabilities. So what's the big picture like in system security in Series 2? Absolutely, Amelia. So the way we've been articulating our security architecture on this new version of products is based on four different pillars, I would call them, security pillars. And basically, it all starts with the secure boot with a root of trust and secure loader that's basically going to allow you to make sure you execute your firmware and not something that's been modified, and we'll talk about it. A second aspect that's really important on this product is the separation between the core that handles everything security and crypto from the application core that provides a lot of value for the implementation and for the developers. Then we have a true random number generator that's going to give you the source of unpredictability and going to help you generate strong keys that are very important in a crypto system. And finally, I like to talk about some kind of new features related to secure debug. And our interface in terms of secure debug is with lock and then unlock pretty innovative functionality I would like to talk about. Okay, let's dive into some details on this true random number generator. Are the random numbers I've been generating fake? And how do I get true ones? What's the deal with that? So in every crypto system, you're going to need some, an element of randomness. It's going to be used either to generate keys or it's going to be used to defeat some attacks by generating some unpredictability into the system. And this need for random number has been there forever. So it all started with, uh, I would say, algorithm on computers, where people would develop some uh, algorithm to create randomness. The problem when you look at them is basically they are seen as a very cyclic kind of uh, random number generation. And uh, the way you enter the circle is basically using a seed. It's kind of oversimplifying the idea, but just think about like you would have a, a chain of different random numbers and all those would rotate constantly, but the point of entry would be basically your seed. So obviously the downside of doing random numbers that way is hackers or anyone who want to guess your next random actually can get this done by just basically monitoring the way you generate those numbers. So predicting my random numbers is bad. Predicting your random numbers is extremely bad because if you look at a system, for instance, using ephemeral keys for a session key, that will allow hackers to actually know what's going to be your next key. So we tend to call them those type of random number generator. We call them pseudo random number generators, and they are normally very deterministic. On our chip on series two, it's a little bit different. We actually have a system that generates true random numbers. And the base of this system is because the random number generator is based on physical process. Basically, the environment is going to have an impact on the numbers that you're going to generate. And now you have a real source of unpredictability. So process, variation, temperatures, stuff like that, 
that all affects what kind of numbers are being generated? Exactly. And that's what creates really the strong capability for you to generate strong keys. One other thing I would like to add on those uh, TRNG on our chip is its NIST compliant. So this is uh, something really important for you. So you don't have to really spend some time trying to evaluate how good is this random number. We actually already tested it against the NIST SP800-90 standard and it passed. So this is already something you can be comfortable and confident using and working with. Okay, got it. So, Gregory, what do you consider as the base of my secure product design? Everything that's going to relate to security has to start from establishing a route of trust. And honestly, the most common attack we see right now is malware injection. Malware injection is basically a hacker injecting a piece of software into your code or modifying the software in a way that they can extract keys or perform a denial of service. So any way that you can prevent those form of attack, especially because they are remote, and so it's really favored by hackers, is going to be a huge benefit for you. So the way you do it normally for a secure boot, the implementation has to start from the smallest piece of code that you can guarantee is not going to be modified by a hacker. And the way to make this happen is basically to store it into an immutable memory, like a ROM, for instance. So as you said, it starts at the beginning. So let's jump back to the beginning all the way to boot up time. Yeah, so what's going to happen on those Series 2 products is basically the firmware is going to start executing a ROM. And as you can see on this uh, diagram here, you have basically two different cores. I mentioned about that earlier. You have the secure element core, that's basically the part you can handle everything crypto and uh, everything security. And you have the application core, which is a Cortex M33. That's basically you're going to program. So when you start from the ROM, the first thing the ROM is going to check is basically the signature of the code executed by the secure element. So because the ROM cannot be modified, we know that this code can be trusted. And by checking the signature through an asymmetric crypto function, we can guarantee that the code is genuine and that's the right code to be executed. The secure element basically code is going to now actually check the signature from the application code. So what that means for you is you're going to have to provision your public key and you're going to store this public key into the secure element OTP of the Series 2 product. That also means that whenever you're going to generate code or updates, you're going to have to sign them with your own private key. Got it. Of course, the big benefit for you is now you can be sure that the code that's going to be executed on the chip is genuine and has been authenticated and generated by you. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about side channel attacks. I've done chalk talks about DPA attacks that don't have to monitor anything but power of a device. So countermeasures for DPA are implemented in software, right? Well, unfortunately, no, because that would be the easy way to do it. But now with the deep machine learning running on DPA, it's actually extremely easy to defeat software countermeasures and to retrieve the key. That's a very common attack, actually, more common than what people think. So basically, the idea behind that is you measure the power, just like you said. It can be done directly at the pin level, or it can be done using electromagnetic radiation. So people will measure this power, and they are going to acquire traces. And normally, they do acquire those traces when you perform a crypto operation. By storing and accumulating all those traces and performing some analysis on them, you are actually able to identify if a zero was computed or if a one was computed. Then by consequence, you're going to be able to actually extract the key at the end of the computation and the analysis. Okay, it always seems like it's been a little hard to synchronize this attack and find out where in my system that the keys are being loaded. Is that correct? That's correct. So one of the biggest challenges when you're going to run a DPA attack, DPA analysis on a chip, is going to be able to synchronize exactly the timing that when a crypto operation is actually being performed by this chip. So we've seen now new kind of attacks where people are using actually deep machine learning. And because deep machine learning can actually identify patterns, they can actually very quickly retrieve the keys and synchronize with the crypto operation without the need for the operator or the hacker to do anything. So requiring machine learning and so forth, doesn't this make it kind of an expensive attack and kind of hard to pull off? Not exactly, Amelia. It's true that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when all this started, those kind of attacks, it was kind of expensive. I mean, back in 2009, you would have probably need like a three PhD guys and something between half a million dollars to a million dollars to do those kind of attacks. TPA tools now are extremely commoditized. And you can actually source on the internet kits that cost something like $200. And it becomes extremely easy for anybody to run those attacks and retrieve your keys. 
wow, okay, so with it being cheap, do we have people just cracking keys for fun? On my opinion, that's actually one of the biggest problems of the DP attacks right now because it's so low touch and it's so accessible to a lot of people. Some hobbyists on the weekend would just run basically DP attacks on products just to crack the system, retrieve the keys, and post their findings on the internet. When you use our DPA countermeasures on the chip, they are hardware, so they are very transparent for you. You just call the function like you would call a normal API. You don't have to specify that DPA needs to be activated. They are hardware. They're already there. Also, our DPA countermeasures are evaluated by our labs we have here at Silicon Labs internally, and also by third party who conduct assessment on our product. Got it. Okay, talking about another aspect, we all have to debug our designs. But it seems like a lot of times the debug interface ends up also being a backdoor for hackers. Is there a protection against that? So obviously the debug interface is an open door for hackers. Hackers can just use the debug to load code or dump your code or inject malware, whatever they want to do. So um, the rule of thumb for insecurity is obviously you want to lock that port. And that's something that's becoming very common in microcontrollers. So most of the companies and products will have a capability to lock their interface. So the hackers cannot use it to hack into the system. So the problem comes when you want to conduct a failure analysis on the chip. If you have a problem in the field and now you want to reopen that interface and look what happened, it becomes extremely complex. And normally what the industry does is you're going to send a command to this debug interface. And the first thing the chip is going to do is basically erase the memories. And once the memories are all erased, the debug port will be reopened, and now you can start conducting your analysis. So if my data is erased, it seems like that takes away a lot of the things I need to debug. So how do we handle that? Exactly, Amelia. That's uh, actually one of the major concerns for customers, and that's a major concern for test engineers when they want to conduct failure analysis. So what we've done on those Series 2 products, you have basically the capability to provision into the chip a public key from the customer and the customer will generate their corresponding private key. Whenever you will want to reopen the debug interface, the chip will send a challenge to the customer, and the customer will sign this challenge creating a crypto token. Okay. When you present the crypto token to the chip, the debug interface will reopen, and the memories will be kept intact. So now, obviously, you are opening a new world for test engineer, application engineer, or even customer, whenever they want to use into a failure, they want to look into a failure analysis, and what happened in the field when something happened, and they can collect all the data they want. Great, I'm feeling safer already, and I can still debug my design in the field. These are all good things. Okay, so let's kind of wrap up some of what we've talked about here. On Series 2 from Silicon Labs, you're going to find four security pillars. The Secure Boot with RTSL. It's going to guarantee you have a trusted firmware execution, and it's going to shield you basically from remote attacks. You have a DKT Secure Core, So the application core and the crypto engine are going to be isolated from each other and communicating only through a mailbox. Everything crypto is going to be protected against DPA attacks using hardware countermeasures. You have a strong true random number generator that's NIST compliant. That's going to allow you to generate unpredictability used in countermeasures or used to generate strong keys in your crypto system. And finally, you have a secure debug with lock and unlock. And this is going to allow you to perform secure advanced analysis while actually being protected from hackers going through your debug interface. Got it. And before we go, let's talk a little bit more about the Series 2 platform itself, since we've been focusing just on the security features until now. So the Series 2 were launched, the EFS32 XG21 product was launched back in April 2019. And all the security features uh, I've described during the conversation are basically available on those products, as well as the XGM210P which is the module version that also contains the same functionalities. Great. Well, I think I'm going to get started and click on that link for more information at a mauser.com site. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gregory. It was a pleasure speaking with you. You're welcome, Emily. It was a pleasure as well. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about the Silicon Labs EFR32 Series 2 platform. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>